How many of you know what a pinhole is? It's a hole that a pin makes, by the way, right? And, and um, I want us to get a little bit of an understanding of what it would look like if we lived life looking through a pinhole. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to take your hand, you're going to put it up against one of your eyes, you're going to close the other eye, and you're going to make that as small as you can to where all you are looking through is the smallest little hole you can create there. And maybe focus it on my head right now. Just focus it on my head for a moment. Okay, once you get it really small and focus, and all you can see is my head now, just move that pinhole, move that to somewhere else in the room and just focus on that. And start thinking to yourself, man, if this is all I could see, how would I describe it? How would I describe my surroundings? What's happening right here, right now? Okay. Now, now take it away and open up both eyes. Now describe what you see. Describe your surroundings. Describe the perspective that you have. It's a lot greater, isn't it? It's a lot greater. You see, often we're living life like this. We're looking through a little pinhole. And our vision, our perspective is so limited. We got to open up our eyes. We got to see the greater picture. Here's another example of what this could look like. Here, throw up that first picture. All right, so what I want you to do is I want you to look at this picture. I want you to describe and think about what is this and how would you dress. This is a weird thing to say, but how would you dress if this was where you're going to spend the day? Right there. When I first looked at this picture, I thought, well, it looks like the moon to me. And I might wear a space suit. It looks like a rocky surface. I might want to wear some, some hiking boots or something like that. But when you get a bigger perspective of where it is, let's look at the second picture here, and you zoom out, you realize, hey, you see that? You see that right there on the screen, that little, right, kind of in the middle left? That was the little rocks that are on this beautiful beach. You get a bigger perspective, you might go, you know what, I might dress a little differently now. If I know that this is what it's going to look like, I might have a swimsuit on. I might be ready to jump into that crystal, you know, blue water. Right? It's about perspective. It's about what we see. We react, we live, we make decisions based on our perspective. Based on what we perceive our situation is. Who we perceive we are. We make decisions about God based on our perspective of Him. Is our perspective limited? Or is it growing? So, a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians are reading the Bible without a very wide, large perspective or context. It's just the reality of things. But how does God want us to read His Word? How does He want us to read His Word? Is there a right way? A wrong way to read the Bible. I think there is a right way and there is a wrong way to read the Bible. For instance, are we supposed to read the Bible like it's some self-help book? Like, hey, I need help. I want to feel better about my life. I want to learn how I can have a better life right now. And so that's how I'm going to approach the Word of God. And I'm going to look for tips and tricks on making my life better today. Is that how we're supposed to read God's Word? No, it's not. Now, are there amazing truths in God's Word that when we read and we, we adopt and make part of our lives that make our lives better? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but is that how we're supposed to read the Word of God? Is that, is that the perspective or, or the approach that we're supposed to take? No. Now, here's another one. Are we supposed to read God's Word like it's a textbook? I just want to learn and get truth so I can answer questions and, and sound like I'm the smartest guy in the room about what, what God says. No. No, knowledge puffs up. No, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to approach the Word of God. Both of the, the ways I just mentioned, by the way, the tips and tricks, you know, self-help or, or a textbook, are going to limit your perspective. They're going to limit what you're really 
picking up that God is putting down for you to grab hold of. Both of those approaches and many other approaches will limit you, can limit your view of the Lord. Looking at the makeup of God's Word, how God put the Bible together, gives us a clear understanding, in my perspective anyway, of how we're supposed to read God's Word. You see, here's the deal. The Bible is a collection of books. It's a collection. It's 66 books. It's a collection of books. Some are history books. Some are Psalms. Some are, are, are wisdom, like, like Proverbs. Some are prophetic books. Others are letters. We have these things called Gospels. We have a, a book called Revelation, which is a prophetic book as well. So you have all these, these books. So based on the way God has given us His Word, we find out how we're supposed to take and read His Word, book by book. Not sentence by sentence or word by word or chapter by chapter. I fear most people have reverted to reading God's Word chapter verse perspective. Let me go look for a chapter or let me go look for a verse to answer a question or to give me some knowledge. And that's pretty much day in, day out, year in, year out, how we approach the Word of God. But God gave us His Word book by book, letter by letter. I don't think I've read this before. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was chapter and verse. In the beginning was the Word, and next to each sentence was a number. I don't, I don't think that that's how it was delivered to us. God didn't put a number next to every single sentence. Bottom line is this. Bottom line is this. We lose so much, we lose most of what God has for us when we chop up the Bible. When we remove a passage of Scripture from its context, and we look at it through a pinhole, we often and mostly misread, misunderstand, misapply what God is saying to us. We just do. You know that old saying, you don't see the forest through the trees. How many of you know that? If you're younger, maybe you haven't heard that. I don't know. Maybe it's an old guy type of a, of a thing. But, but it makes sense when you, when you really look at it, right? We just, we, you're in a forest, and, and, and all you see is you're just going from one tree to the next, and you don't have a full perspective of really where you are and what's really going on all around you. Too often, that's how we interact with the Word of God. From one tree to the next, missing the bigger picture, the bigger message of what God is saying. So here's what we're going to do this, this coming year. We're going to read the New Testament together, book by book. That's what we're going to do. Okay? I mean, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull the pastor card on you right now, right? I'm pulling the pastor card right now. You know, you're like, yeah, I go to church and I, I love having a pastor. I need a pastor. We like having pastors. Pastors are great. They're wonderful. I'm going to pull the pastor card and I'm going to say, this is what we're doing this year. This is your church. If you're part of this congregation, part of this flock here at Heaven and Life Church, here's what we're doing. We, you, me, we're going to read the New Testament together this year. The whole thing, right? It's only 27 books, right? We're going to read it together this year. We're going to go through a year-long survey of the New Testament. I'm calling it Mission 27. Why 27? Because there's 27 books in the New Testament, right? So we're going we're gonna to do this thing called Mission 27, and the purpose of this year-long study is this. It's not for me to teach you Scripture line by line. And you know, we do that a lot here at Evan Life Church. In fact, just last week, Brad did that, line by line, Romans 3, right? Taking you through that section of Scripture, getting very detailed about, about justification, atonement, all those things. We need those moments. We need to be doing that. We need a steady diet of that line-by-line expository type teaching. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend about 30 
to 33 weeks because some of these books we're going to take two weeks on, like the first one, Matthew. We're going to take a couple weeks on. But we're going to spend a pretty decent chunk of our Sunday mornings getting ourselves ready to read a book of the Bible together, to process it together. I'm not going to go through line by line because that would mean like six, seven, eight hour church services and sermons. Now, we could do that if y'all are up. If I can get 100% engagement in that, I'm all for it. We could go and go and go. But here's what I'm wanting to do. I'm hoping that every Sunday morning, I'm planning, I'm believing God for this, that every Sunday morning, we're going to do an overview of a book of the New Testament. And this overview, and I'm not talking just just little simple, here's who wrote it, here's when it happened, and just all the little basic, basic. I'm hoping that we're going to dive deeper into this. We're going, to, we're going to give the tools and the keys so that as you dive into the Word of God yourself, you have a Bible, and if you don't, we'll give you one for free, by the way, all right? We got them. Coming out of our ears, as they say. We're a church. We're supposed to have them coming out of it. We got them. We got a Bible for you. Let us know, right? We're, we're here for you. We got the Word of God for you. And Sunday mornings is going to be giving you the tools, the encouragement, the keys to help you study the Word of God for yourself. This is going to be a jump start every Sunday morning designed to launch you into a fruitful study of God's Word. The Bible is going to change you more than my preaching is going to ever change you. In fact, most of you, Sunday night, you can't say but a few things the pastor even said that morning. I don't know what he said. I think he said, amen. I mean, it's true, but you know what I know? I know that the Word of God, my words may return void, but God's words, they do not return void. They hit the mark. They do what no preacher can do. God's Word won't leave you the same. And so that's why I'm pleading, I'm imploring, I'm pulling the pastor card, and I'm saying, we're going to do this together. It's worth it. I believe God is going to bless each and every one of us as we engage in this. I believe God is going to expand your perspective. But I've been walking with the Lord for 30 years. Congratulations. So have I. And I got a lot to learn. I want my perspective to be expanded. I'm not all that in a bag of chips. I haven't arrived. Either have you. We need all that God has for us. We need to be stretched. We need our perspective to be widened and expanded. And I don't care how long, three days, 30 years you've been walking with the Lord. As we do this together, your perspective of the Word of God, of God Himself, is going to be expanded. This is going to be fruitful. It's going to be good. Jesus said, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So here's the mission. Mission 27. It's a purposeful discipleship process. Here's how we're going to do it. It's four steps. You ready for this? And you can catch these there. By the way, we got notes out on the U version. If you want to go out of the U version to the events, part of U version that's going to show Evident Life Church there, just click on that. You can get the notes. We'll have them up online and that stuff for you later. Because if you're like me, you need that, right? All right. And if you like writing notes, do it. It's a better way to learn. Get that piece of paper out and write some notes. And I want to encourage you on this, too. If you can, if it's possible, get your, like, your paper Bible, like your, your Bible like that as you go through and you read it. Because I'm going to ask you to underline some things and circle some things and make some notes. And, and let's really connect with some key themes and messages that the Word has for us. So here it is, four steps. Mission 27, purposeful discipleship process. Number one, put it up there. Let's go. Listen to the Sunday sermon. And I'm not saying that just because I want you to listen to me. It's because this is going to be a jump start for you. This is going to give some keys and some tools and stir some things up. So as you go into the Word, that book this week, things are going to start jumping out at you. Start, start showing up, and, and, and it's going to kind of, I'm, uh, listen, I just thought of it. You know, like with a washing machine, it's got that agitation cycle or whatever. 
Sunday morning's going to be that agitator kind of cycle, right? You're going to come in, we're going to kind of agitate things and kind of move things around and shake things up for you so that when you get back in the Word, it's like, whoa, things are kind of falling over here and coming over here, and I'm not, oh, I haven't seen it that way before. Very cool. Perspective increasing. Perspective increasing. So step one, listen to Sunday's sermon. That's setting up the context. Number two. And this is the part that if you don't do this, it's a waste of time. And that's, you got to read the entire book or gospel or letter during that week. Read it, the whole thing. You know what? I did the work for you here. I went out and I Googled it. And I said, how long does it take to read each book in the Bible? And it told me. Because Google knows everything uh, well, about you if you're online anyway. But anyway, so <laughs> that's unfortunately true. The longest it takes to read any one of the books in the New Testament, Matthew and Luke will take you the longest. Two and a half hours is how long it will take you to read Matthew. Two and a half hours. How much TV do you watch? How much Netflix do you watch? How much time do you spend on social media? How, how is that improving your perspective on life? I'm sure it's doing a great job. I'm sure it's doing a great job. Such a better person because of all of that stuff, right? Imagine taking two and a half hours. I mean, some weeks, it's going to be 15 minutes. That's all it's going to take to read it. And you're going to like, well, that was too easy. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to read ahead. And that's encouraged too. That's fine. But each week that we focus on a book, I want to encourage you to read the whole book. Now, I will tell you, like with Matthew, if you want to split it up into two weeks, because we are, you can read the first 12 chapters this week, and then the remaining 16 chapters the following week. All right, so one, listen to the Sunday sermon. Two, read the entire book. Three, answer the weekly questions. They're just simple. They're really for you just to be engaging and, and connecting with some of the main themes and, and things to grab out of the book. And then four, process together by attending a life group with others. It's that Acts 2, 42 through 47 lifestyle, how we don't do life on an island. This isn't just me and Jesus. This is me as part of the body of Christ with my brothers and sisters growing in the Lord. Each disciple didn't walk with Jesus alone. He walked with Jesus with 11 other men and Christ. That's God's way of doing things. So we're going to do this. So if you're not in life group, Tickles life group, we have other life groups that you can join and get connected with, and we can start other life groups if we need to. It would be a great problem to have. So we're going to be students of the Bible. Like the Bereans, it says that they eagerly examined the Scriptures. And they were given a thumbs up by the Lord for doing that. They eagerly examined the Scriptures. They wanted perspective. They wanted to know what God was saying. That's in Acts 17, 11. So you ready to go? All right. The New Testament, Mission 27. Here we go. Buckle up. Hold on. This is going to change your life. I know it will because you're going to be reading the Word. That's the only way I can, reason I can say that, okay? All right. There's four Gospels. We're going to, we're going to dive in. We're going to start with, with the Gospel of Matthew. But we're going to start by just talking about the Gospels. There are four Gospels. And you're like, wow, this is already getting so deep. This is incredible. The pastor just reminded me that there are four Gospels. There are four Gospels. They're similar, but they're different, right? So we have these four different books. They're unlike any other book in the Bible. A Gospel is. They're called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's answer this question first. What is a Gospel? And go ahead, shout out. What is a Gospel? It's good news. Good news. And what else? What is a Gospel? Okay, okay, all right. All right, message of peace, reconciliation, the good news. A lot of people say it's like an ancient biography of the life and the ministry of Jesus. And it is. It is that. I like to think of the, the gospel simple. I'm sorry, simplify everything. So I look at the gospel as it's an announcement. Hey, the Messiah, he's here. Jesus is here. Everything's changed. You need to know him. The gospel. Some people look at the gospels as a news bulletin. You know, like the person who goes around, read all about it, read all about it, and it has all these stories. 
you know, about Jesus, about this, this happened, then this happened. Wow, 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 wow. The Gospels. But why four Gospels? Why didn't God just do one? After all, I mean, yeah, you got overlapping, you got repeating of stories. Sometimes people look at it and they'll read one, they'll read Matthew and then they'll read the, you know, the same type of thing in Luke and they'll go, man, these guys aren't even on the same page. You know, this guy's saying this stuff and then this guy's saying this stuff. What's going on here? Why do we have four Gospels? Why didn't God just simplify it and give us one? That's, you got the right idea All right, Now you're stealing my sermon. Di- four different witness accounts, different perspectives. Exactly. First of all, God knows what he's doing. God gave us four Gospels, and God knows what he's doing. And here's the other thing. God knows what we need. He knows what we need. And he, in his sovereignty, says, my people need four Gospels. And so God chose four different people with their own way of looking at life, their own way of interacting with God, He chose four people with their own perspective of him to deliver, to breathe his word through them to give us a complete picture of Jesus. It's awesome. Four people, four different angles, four different perspectives. You know, sometimes I can explain something to my kids. And I can say, hey, this is what's going on. And this is how it's all going to happen. And they look back at me, and it's like I'm a four-headed monster. It's like they have no clue what I'm talking about. Total confusion. Then, not often, but every once in a while, I would recognize, oh, they don't get it, so I better change how I'm saying it. And I would come about it, and I would, I would say the same thing, but from a different perspective. Maybe bring it down a level. Maybe change where I'm coming from or how I'm saying it or the wording or or something like that. And I'll deliver essentially the same message but in a different way. And all of a sudden you see the light bulbs going on in their head. They get it. We're on the same page. It's all good. In a lot of ways, that's the four Gospels. They provide a more complete picture of Christ. How many of you know that the entire Bible is the Word of God. It's Scripture. It's been breathed out by God Himself. It's the inspired Word of God, as it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16. But here's what's really cool, I think. Some people, it still trips them up. They've been walking with the Lord for a while. I think it's cool that God uses humans. He used humans to deliver His Word, to breathe His Word to the world. He did it through humans. To me, that shows the sovereignty of God, that He's willing to do things with us. And He used human authors with different backgrounds and personalities to accomplish His purpose through writing His Word. You know, think about this. I want want to point this out. God is still using humans to deliver His Word. To minister his love, to do miracles. He's using you and me. That, that, that's who he's using now. Are, are we living with that expectation? Are, are, we, are we seeing that in our lives that God is using us, that, that he's speaking through us to others? Not new revelation, not, not, not that's what I'm talking about, but, but to speak his word, his truth, his love, and then to to bring his truth and his love and to show his truth and his love to a lost and dying world. He did it when he gave us his word and he's still using people as his instruments for his ministry. But anyway, each gospel had a distinct purpose. And each gospel writer emphasized different aspects of the person and the ministry of Jesus Christ. So check this out. Mark saw Jesus as a son of man. So when you read the gospel of Mark, son of man, son of man, son of man. When you're in the gospel of Mark, let's look at what what he's talking about and why he's talking about Jesus as a son of man. 
But in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew saw Jesus as the king of the Jews. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. Jesus being the king of the Jews. Luke's Gospel presents Jesus as the savior of the world. John rounds things out with Jesus as the son of God. Four different perspectives of who Jesus is. And and when I look at this, it's like four corners of a picture frame that together frame give us a complete picture of who Jesus is. Why do we have four Gospels? Because we need them to get a full understanding. If, if, If God was writing a story about me, he would only need one, and it would be a couple sentences long, right? But for us to get a full understanding, because I'm pretty simple, but to get a full understanding of God, Jesus, who is the infinite one, four Gospels, four perspectives that frame and give us that complete picture of Jesus. And together, these four Gospels in this complete picture show us a lot about Jesus. For instance, Mark in his Gospel talks about what Jesus did. So when you read the gospel, it's like Mark, it's like one action after another. It's like like Mark could be a sportscaster, you know, and then LeBron passes the ball to so-and-so, and and this, this, and then he's he's cutting to the corner, and it's a three-pointer, and it's up, and it's kind of like one action after another. The gospel of Mark, action, action, action. But when you get into Matthew and Luke, it's not about what Jesus did so much, although it is, but, but they add what Jesus said and the preaching, and the sermons of Jesus. When you get into the gospel of John, John focused on who Jesus was. So you got Mark focusing on on what Jesus did, Matthew and Luke focusing on what Jesus said, John focusing on who Jesus was, giving us a complete, more complete picture of the Messiah, our Savior, our Lord, our King, Jesus. So we got to dive in right now to the first gospel, Matthew's gospel to the Jews. And I might have bitten off a little more than I can chew today of trying to get all this in in one sermon. But you all are gracious with me, aren't you? All right. All right. The Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel to the Jews. And that's very important. Matthew's Gospel to the Jews. First Gospel, known as the Gospel of Matthew. It's named after the, the writer, the author of that that gospel, Matthew, who was a disciple, a follower of Christ Jesus, probably wrote it in about A.D. 55 to A.D. 65, still pretty early on in the church. Uh, most of the Christians in the church was, were still Jews. There was still these, you know, pulling Jews out of their Judaism into Christianity, realizing that Jesus was a fulfillment. He's the Messiah. And so Matthew's focus of this gospel, of his gospel that he wrote, was a gospel to the Jews. And he brings us a gospel from a very Jewish perspective. Now, he used Mark, more than likely, as the framework for his gospel. Remember, Mark just, it's the shortest one. It's just, here's what Jesus did, here's what Jesus did. Uh, Most think that Mark was probably the first gospel written, that Luke also used much of Mark's gospel uh, in, in forming the gospel of Luke. Mark started his gospel when Jesus was 30 years old, but Matthew goes all the way back to the birth of Jesus. Even includes story like about the Magi. Why did he do this? Do you ever ask yourself why? Why did Matthew give us the gospel in this way? Why did he go all the way back to the birth of Jesus, but Mark didn't? Does Mark not think it's important? What's going on here? I, I want to make this quick, quick side note. Here's another thing. So Matthew comes at it from a Jewish perspective. Uh, the first five books of the Bible are pretty important to the Jews. It's the Pentateuch. First five books of the Bible. Super important, right? It's the Torah. It's the law. It's, it's all of that. It's so important to them. Do you know that in the Gospel of Matthew, that Matthew presents five sermons from Jesus? Theologians don't think that that's an accident. You got the five books, the Old Testament, that the Jews would would know well. And then you've got the five sermons of Jesus showing the new way, the new covenant, the fulfillment, what has happened with that. 
We're going to talk about that a little bit more here just briefly today about this tie-in of the Old Testament and the New Testament. See, Matthew intends to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah. That's the purpose of the Gospel of Matthew, the primary purpose. That and to help make disciples of new believers. And so, of all the Gospels, I know what we typically do, and by the end of our study and our survey of the New Testament, we're going to maybe have some different approaches here, but I know what we typically do is anybody who's interested in Jesus, we say, now go read the Gospel of John. If you're sharing Christ with a Jew, I would encourage that you would take them to the Gospel of Matthew. Because the whole point of the Gospel of Matthew is to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the fulfillment. He is the promised Messiah. Don't reinvent what God has already done through the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's presentation of words and deeds. Second thing I want to I cover here. I talked about five sermons. There's five sermons um, that Matthew presents that Jesus gives. And then right after each sermon is a whole bunch of, of the ministry of Jesus, is his deeds of what Jesus said and then what Jesus did when he walked on this earth. Jesus came and he showed us that he came to not only bring the word but bring deed. The kingdom is about word and deed. It's both and. And as you read the Gospel of Matthew, here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to say, okay, it's obviously important. Truth is important. The words of Jesus are important. And I need to embrace those words, and I need to share those words with others. Because in those words is life. But also the ministry of Jesus was and is important. And if I'm going to walk like Christ and be like Christ, not only do I need to share truth and life with others and open up my mouth, but I also need to act like Jesus. I need to minister like Jesus. I need to come along those who are hurting and broken and minister to them and pray for them and watch God show up in His kingdom work in and through my life. When you read the Gospel of Matthew this week, look for the words of Jesus and the deeds of Jesus. And then ask God to use you in that way, to be His mouthpiece and to be His hands and feet even this week, bringing His kingdom. We're going to talk a lot about the kingdom of God next week. One thing you're going to notice when you read the Gospel of Matthew is that Jesus taught with authority. It says that in Matthew 7, 29. And that he ministered as one with power. Sometimes we, we just continue to remember Jesus as just this like little teddy bear. We think of him as a teddy bear. He is God. All authority, all power. And when he walked on this earth, that's how he ministered, with power and authority. And we think about all the healings that Jesus did, and we're like, wow, that's awesome, that's powerful. Oh, he raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, he turns water into wine. This is amazing. He, he's, he is powerful. He, he was anointed, right? You know what Jesus did? He also denounced some Jewish towns when he was walking around the Sea of Galilee. And he said, he basically said to them that, that because y'all are so lacking in faith and so full of sin and so unrepentant, that y'all aren't going to exist much longer. Woe to you, he said. He spoke it. He said, woe to you. Chorazin and Bethsaida, and then he even said that over Capernaum. And when you go to the Sea of Galilee, I've been there a couple times. When you go there, none of those cities that he said woe to and that he denounced with his mouth are there any longer. There are remnants of Capernaum, but nobody lives there. It's an amazing place to go and to sit on the Sea of Galilee and to remember this is where he called his disciples. 
and to be reminded that he's called you also to follow him. It really comes alive. But you can go around the Sea of Galilee, and you're not going to see those cities that, that with authority and power, he spoke woe over. Look for the power and the authority of Christ in the Gospel of Matthew. Is that how you walk with him today? I want to get to the final point, and that's Matthew proves that Jesus is the fulfillment. This is the main thing I want you to get this week as you read at least the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. That Jesus is the fulfillment. Theologians believe that one of the reasons that Matthew is the first gospel in our Bible, the first book in the New Testament, is because it links best with the Old Testament. Let's talk about why that's important. First of all, there's like 29 direct quotes in the gospel of Matthew, direct quotes from the Old Testament. There's over 130 indirect references in the gospel of Matthew to the Old Testament. But sadly, most Christians don't understand, don't comprehend, don't appreciate the inseparable and the sovereign link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Maybe you've heard me say this before, but I was in a church service that was not here. Is that a different church? I was in a church service, and up from the stage, the worship pastor says, I'm so glad, aren't you guys happy and excited that we serve the God of the New Testament, not the God of the Old Testament? And I about wanted to jump out of my seat and say, heresy. I probably should have. Anyway, could have, would have, should have. Anyway, I didn't do that, but, but, it, but it is, it's, it's heresy. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. I'm talking about Jesus is the God of the Old Testament every bit as much as he is the God of the New Testament. In fact, the Old Testament would not exist apart from Christ Jesus. It would have no purpose apart from Christ Jesus. For everything in the Old Testament is pointing toward, is announcing Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This whole book, all 66, full of Jesus. In fact, when you read the Bible, when you read the Old Testament, look for Jesus. He's everywhere. You wouldn't have any of this without Jesus. None of it. And it's not two stories. It's not a, well, and I wish, frankly, I wish it wasn't called old and new. I wish it was called the promise and fulfillment. Or something like that. I'm just making this up right now. I'm just saying that's what I think. I would love that to be called that. The promise and the fulfillment. Because it's not old news or old stuff or expired stuff. It's all Jesus. It's all what God has unfolded and is unfolding in through because of Jesus. The whole thing. And the gospel of Matthew is that link between the Old Testament and the New Testament, helping Jews understand that here he is. Here he is. You know what you read in in Genesis? All the prophets, all the Psalms. He's here. He's Jesus. So Matthew presents the genealogy of Jesus. Why? Mark didn't. But why does Mark present the, I mean, Matthew present the genealogy of Jesus? Why? Because he wants to show the Jews the connection that Jesus has between Abraham and David. He is the Messiah. Oh, I, I don't like the genealogy parts. It's important that it's there. It's sovereign. It's, it's inseparable. It's, it's divine that that's right there. Appreciate what God is doing through Matthew in that genealogy. So important. Don't just blow over it. Take it in. Let, let God minister to you even in that part. Okay, then you've got the story of the birth of Jesus. Why does Matthew have that? He wasn't there. He started following him when Jesus was 30 years old. It's not like Matthew was there. Why does he go back and give 
the story of the birth of Jesus and the Magi coming and bringing gifts. Why all of that history? Why? Because he wants the Jews to understand that this Messiah didn't come from Nazareth, but actually Bethlehem, as it was prophesied. You can read about that in Matthew 2. Important. We got to get that. We got to understand that for our perspective to go from, oh, how is this, you know, just this little thing that makes sense to me right now, these little tips and tricks, you know, from God's word that make me feel good and give me goosebumps to a bigger perspective of what God is saying about redemptive history and how we fit into it and everything just gets a lot more marvelous as a result. I got to keep rolling here, guys. Y'all are getting hungry. I sense it. Stomachs are growling, but we're good. Matthew is the one who recorded Jesus as saying, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. It's Matthew's gospel to the Jew. In fact, fulfill, the word fulfill or fulfilled, is used 16 times in the book of Matthew. Fulfill or fulfilled, 16 times in the book of Matthew, and the majority of the references draw a connection between Jesus and the Old Testament, the prophetic foreshadowing of Christ in the Old Testament, and there's every single one of those, there's a link. I want to encourage you to go back and not only look at that, that statement, he fulfilled this, the first one is in Matthew 1, where the, the, the term fulfilled is used. Take note of that. Appreciate. Promise made by God Promise fulfilled in Christ. Promise made by God. Promise fulfilled in Christ. Take note of that. Don't let it just go in one ear and out the other. Get a greater, bigger perspective of just how faithful God is through Christ. Let it change your paradigm. Let it shift you and move you. In fact, I want you to underline or circle every time the word fulfill or fulfillment's used. And you should have 16 of them when you get through Matthew. 16 of them. Matthew is wanting to draw the Jews to Jesus. And he's also wanting the church to remember their Jewish roots. I just want to make this statement. You know, some people think that God chose the Jews at the exclusion of everybody else. Don't, no, 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 no. When God chooses somebody, every time you go back and do a re, do a do a relook, get a get a get a bigger perspective, a, a God sized perspective when you read about how God chooses and why He chooses people. God chose the Israelites, the Jews, not at the exclusion of everybody else, but to be a blessing to the rest of us. When God chooses you to deliver His word to somebody, or to or or. God doesn't choose you just to bless you. He chooses you to be a blessing to others. He chose the Jews not just to bless them, but for them to be a blessing to all of us. And so as Matthew is writing this gospel, he's bringing the Jews and the Christians together. He's reminding and, and, and highlighting the, to the Jews that this is the fulfillment. Christ has come, and he's reminding the Christians of their Jewish roots. It's so important for us to all understand that. He's telling Jews to not run away from Christians. He's telling the Christians to not run away from Jews. Jesus has linked us together. In fact, as you look at the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and, and I'm going to steal back a, a, a term that has been used by the dark side, if you will, by the evolutionists, the missing link. Jesus is the missing link. He's the link. We'll just call him the link between the Old Testament, the promise, and the new covenant, the fulfillment. He's the link. He's the link between the Jew and the church and the church and the Jew. He's the link. And Matthew highlights that. So I'm going to close it up now. Um, use this message, I know this was a fire hose today. It's like, whoa, I, got, I, got, I just blew over so many of my notes today. But I know it's a fire hose. But I, I pray that you 
would now do step two of mission 27 of our process. And that is read the gospel of Matthew this week. Look, specifically this week, because we're going to do it again next week, and we're going to be talking about the kingdom of heaven next week. So important in the Gospel of Matthew. But this week, I specifically urge you, as you read through the Gospel of Matthew, to look at how Matthew is showing the world and is reminding even you that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises that God has made. He has fulfilled it. It is accomplished. It is finished in and through Christ. As you're reading, underline what the Lord has given you, highlight it, but also just read it like a book. This doesn't have to be your time of deep study that's going to get you off into one particular sentence for the whole week and you miss the bigger perspective. I want you to, to get a full perspective of what God is wanting us to receive through this entire book, this gospel that was given to us through Matthew. Let it speak to you on more of a macro level than on the micro level that we typically like to go to. I want you to also look for the powerful ministry of Jesus and remember that he's still a miracle worker and that we should still be expecting him to do miracle upon miracle upon miracle. Let's stand up.